afternoon uh, or good morning if you're on the West Coast. My name is Nick Loris and I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for C3 Solutions and I have the privilege of hosting today's webinar, uh, Reducing Barriers to Meet America's Energy Needs and Environmental Goals. Uh, it's certainly a timely discussion as uh, the national average for a gallon of gasoline is $4.60. In some states it's higher than $5 per gallon and in California it's higher than 6 and Electricity bills are going up and some analysts have warned that things might get rougher uh, with rates going up even higher uh, and potential energy shortages uh, during our summer months as we're demanding and using more energy. We have higher levels of inflation that's affecting the economy, supply chain constraints and bottlenecks that's affecting the economy, uh, and an ongoing war in Ukraine, uh, just to name a few things. Um, at the same time, there are several environmental and climate priorities that the Biden administration has laid out, including reducing emissions 50% uh, below 2005 levels by 2030, net zero emissions by 2050, as well as uh, their 30 by 30 conservation initiative, uh, its 10 year forest management to uh, plan to reduce the risk of wildfires. Uh, and as our panelists uh, joining from Montana knows very well, that wildfire season is, is right around the corner. Um, maybe it's already here. Um, it feels like it's increasingly becoming a year round concern, which is concerning for everybody, but particularly for our friends in the West who face more risk. Um, so we're gonna get into all of these issues and more, uh, and there's no real silver bullet that's going to magically bring down the price of energy um, or help us reach our environmental goals, but I do believe there are many policy fixes that would help the market's ability to respond to changes in prices uh, and to make investments in conservation and land management and biodiversity more efficient and more effective. I'm privileged to be joined today by three panelists who have thought, uh, written, and communicated uh, extensively on these issues with different areas of specialized expertise. Uh, I've learned a lot from their work and from the work of their organizations. Uh, in fact, in about a week, uh, we at C3 are going to be uh, releasing a climate and freedom policy agenda that puts forth a set of solutions that we think will increase and diversify energy supplies and increase opportunities for investments in uh, healthy ecosystems and environmental stewardship, uh, as well as encourage innovation kind of ac across the economy broadly. Uh, it's, it's what we feel is good economic policy that has a number of environmental uh, and climate co-benefits in terms of reducing emissions and enhancing uh, climate resiliency. Uh, and again, several of the chapters of this report build off the prolific work that organizations like ClearPath and the Property and Environment Research Center uh, and the Tax Foundation have done in their respective issue areas. Uh, so with that, let's get started. And just to quickly lay out the format of, of today's webinar, um, first, rather than me reading off uh, folks' bios, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about your organization and the work you do and give a brief 30,000 foot overview of kind of how your work relates to the discussion today. Uh, then I will lead a moderated discussion among uh, the four of us. Uh, and with any remaining time, we'll wrap up with audience questions. So please feel to send any questions in the chat and we'll get to those. So um, we'll start with Hannah and then go to Matt and then uh, finish up with Alex. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nick, uh, for inviting me to join you today. I'm Hannah Downey. I'm the policy director at PERC, uh, the Property and Environment Research Center. Uh, as Nick alluded to, we are based in Bozeman, Montana, uh, where a lot of these issues are really just front and center in our everyday lives. Uh, so at PERC, we are a 40-year-old conservation research institute uh, dedicated to exploring ways that uh, markets, market-based solutions, property rights, and trade can help solve environmental challenges. So my focus is really on the natural resources side of things. Some of my co-panelists today are incredible experts um, in energy and energy infrastructure and that side of things. My focus is much more on like land, water, and wildlife. But I think as we'll see in this conversation today, there's a lot of overlap um, between these discussions and the regulatory barriers that challenge our, our moves for conservation. And so at PERC, our goal really is, how do we do conservation better? How do we involve uh, private partners? How do we get the incentives right? How do we make sure efforts are, are voluntary and respecting people's property rights? 
So with that, um, as, as Nick mentioned, wildfire is a huge issue for us. And so a lot of my conversation today is going to kind of focus on that. As we have these huge and increasing catastrophic wildfire risks, how do we move forward and address some of those risks so that we don't see the terrible uh, impacts to humans, the environment, infrastructure, all of those things, and largely through um, active forest management. So that requires uh, breaking through a lot of regulatory barriers that we will get into later today. But ultimately, thank you so much uh, for having me, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, Matt, you want to go? Absolutely. And happy to echo all of Hannah's points. And Nick, thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Uh, my name is Matthew Malo. I'm a policy analyst at ClearPath. Uh, we're based in DC and our mission is to accelerate breakthrough innovations, uh, primarily in the energy and industrial sectors, uh, working with policy makers uh, on an all of the above portfolio, everything from advanced nuclear to carbon capture, uh, to technologies that maybe just be over the horizon, like hydrogen, for example. Um, at ClearPath, we're very excited uh, over the past couple of years, the work that Congress has done, namely through the Energy Act of 2020, to promote innovation uh, and fund some of these demonstration projects that will not only accelerate our ability to reduce emissions, but also to create technology here in America that we can export around the world. Uh, but as you learned today, that's only half the challenge, right? Funding is the easy part. Uh, it's the matter of actually getting these projects built uh, and going from the first of a kind to a second, third, and fourth of a kind and that's where the rubber is going to meet the road over the next five years. So at ClearPath, we're focused on how do we continue to promote these new innovative breakthrough technologies uh, and doing so in a conservative way. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Alex? Uh, sure. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, um, I'm Alex Morishanu. I work at the Tax Foundation. And our mission is to uh, improve lives through the promotion of tax policies that lead to greater economic growth and opportunity uh, in the United States and abroad. Um, I would say there's a, a Wall Street Journal reporter named Richard Rubin who covered the covers the, the tax beat who says every story has a tax angle. Um, there are a lot of fun examples that I could go into there, but uh, you know, I work on the federal team, I cover federal policy, which means a whole lot of things. But uh, if I have one focus, it's how tax policy ends up touching uh, a handful of sort of non purely tax issues, um, including among other things, sort of energy and climate, um, but also manufacturing, uh, infrastructure, and uh, housing, uh, among, among others. So, um, Taxes are sort of ubiquitous policy concern, and so uh, they certainly have relevance in the environmental debate as well. Yeah, they certainly do. And, and Alex, I just want to stick with you for a minute because I think gas prices are certainly on the forefront of everybody's minds right now, and it, you know it's it's one of those things that's uh, regressive, uh, that it impacts uh, middle and lower income families the most, uh, and every dollar that they spend additionally on gasoline uh, and energy bills broadly, it's fewer dollars available for food and health care and vacations and other resources that families may need. And, and as you mentioned, kind of taxes hit about just about everything, and there's uh, a number of different proposals out there to ostensibly address uh, gas prices right now. There's, uh, you know, windfall profits tax bill that's out there. There's price gouging legislation. I don't know if you've been following that necessarily. Um, there's been the consideration of, um, you know, ha taking a break or, or having a gas tax holiday at both the federal and state level. So was wondering if you would be uh, able to comment on what you think about those proposals and if you think they're good or they're bad or, or what policymakers should be focused on. Yeah, so I think in the current context, um, both in the broader macro economy as a whole and energy markets or you know gas gas prices, um, it's important to consider two things: supply and demand. Um, prices go up, uh, or inflation goes up in the macro question, either because demand is going up or supply is going down. And I think most of the policies on the table, at least in the tax space, around energy policy, um, usually are pushing in that wrong direction. Um, 
either they're trying to increase demand, they're going to increase demand or reduce supply. Um, the gas tax holidays are a are, are mistake for, for a couple of reasons. The first to begin with is that gas taxes are a pretty effective way to fund um, basic infrastructure um, to finance road maintenance. If you cut gas taxes, you've got to find some other revenue source to do that. Um, and that whatever that tax is, it's probably going to be worse for the economy as a whole. Um, second, I think it's worth keeping in mind that the, the federal gas tax is not very big in the context of um, gas prices as a whole. Uh, the federal gas tax is like 18 plus cents a gallon. Uh, the price of gas has increased, what, something where between two and two and a half dollars uh, a, a gallon in the past sort of year plus uh, or two years, I think, since, since the bottom in, uh, you know, about two years ago. Um, so in the context of those sort of wild swings, um, getting rid of the gas tax doesn't really change things much. Um, and lastly is, is inflation. Um, inflation is driven by too much, you know, money chasing too few goods and services. Um, and so when you cut a tax on, on consumption, which is, is what the gas tax is, um, that sort of, at least on the margin, it's not a very big tax. So when, you know, it's not like, well, we're, we had, you know, 8% inflation, and then we cut the gas tax, and now we're at 12% inflation. It's, you know, a marginal effect. Um, but, uh, you know, that would, on, on the whole, you know, worsen the inflation problem. And that by, by subsidizing demand, by, by sort of expanding demand. Now, the windfall profits tax is the opposite story. The windfall profits tax is penalizing uh, investment or, or expansion of, of supply. There is this idea in, in economics of supernormal returns, where you have profits that exceed the risk-adjusted normal rate of return on capital. This is a you know not to get too much in the weeds there, but the thing is that like the the risk adjustment part is is very hard for policymakers to draw policy around. It's not like you can just say, well, oh, okay, if you're earning more than ten percent return, that's that's excess. You know that's not normal. That's excess, and you have to pay a special tax on that because there's risk involved. Energy is very risky. Uh, there's a lot of you know capital require uh, capital investment required, and price is very volatile. In the past like half decade plus, we've seen sort of two major price collapses. Um, a lot of the big companies lost money, and a lot of smaller firms had to shut out their operations entirely. The risk you make when you make a big investment in energy is that the years of plenty outweigh the years of famine. Um, so when you say in the good years oh, well, those are just excess profits. Um, we got to claw those back. Uh, that's really going to put a damper on, on investment. Um, so honestly, I don't think, at least in the short term, there is a tax policy answer on the table for these really high energy prices. In the long term, you know, there's this idea of induced innovation where at times when there are really high energy prices, that gets companies will invest more in more energy efficient technology or more green technology that is less sort of subject to the whims of the oil and gas markets. And, you know, whether or not like Putin decides that, you know, Ukraine should be, you know, should be Russian or something and decides to invade somewhere um, that, you know, incentivizes companies to say, maybe we should move away from this. But that's a long-term thing, and uh, I don't think that, that that sort of provides much relief. So I don't think there's much answers in the tax space. I think a lot of those ideas just seem to make the problem worse. So I guess I'd turn it over to uh, other policy levers that uh, I'm sure the panelists will be able to go into, other panelists will be able to go into. Yeah, I think there's a lot there, and I think you touched on two really important things. One is just the, the, the fundamental economics of its uh, supply and demand issue, for sure, uh, and also the need for policy and regulatory certainty and that and that tends to kind of ping pong back and forth when we have changes in administration and, and changes in who uh, runs uh, the house and the senate uh, and from a supply and demand perspective uh, you know obviously there are probably some some regulatory fixes that could be done to uh, increase supplies in the short term i know folks have talked about um changing the, the, the timing of when we switch from winter blends of gasoline to summer blends of gasoline to eat, increase some supply online and keep our refining capacity online. Uh, the Jones Act comes up as kind of some constraints on, on transportation from uh, U.S. port to U.S. port. So there, there may be some things to do on the margin, but I think uh, 
looking longer term and, and we're at least in more in the intermediate term, uh, the need to increase supplies through regulatory certainty. And so Matt, I was wondering, you know, at, at your work at ClearPath, you, you focus a lot on this energy innovation and increasing and diversifying energy supplies. What do you see as kind of the biggest uh, regulatory and policy choke points from that happening? Well, I think it's pretty clear that when we look at, you know, gas prices, it's not something that re are released from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is going to solve, right? We've seen the administration try that failed Band-Aid uh, at least, you know, more than once at this point. Ultimately, it comes down to making sure that we can produce American energy here at home. Uh, and with that, the regulatory certainty piece, we've seen, you know, challenges with this administration to permit projects. And let's not pretend that this is a new issue. You know, the National Environmental Policy Act is 50 years old. And I would argue that the priorities that this nation set in the 1970s are very different than the priorities we see today in 2022. Ultimately, if we are going to decarbonize the grid and whatever level of penetration, you know, our ambition leads us to, we need to be able to build new infrastructure of all sorts, right? That's new pipelines that might be natural gas today, but CO2 or hydrogen tomorrow. Uh, it's projects uh, like advanced nuclear, carbon capture, all these different things that currently are really trapped in this regulatory bottleneck. And, and there are a number of reasons for that, right? It's not any one silver bullet that we'll see. Um, but it's a, a growing conversation. We've started to see policymakers, uh, which has traditionally been conservative policymakers that have been uh, trumping this issue, but it's starting to spill over into the Democrats as well. Uh, Senator Schatz, for example, the past uh, several weeks has been really championing the idea that if we're going to meet clean energy targets, whether they're federal, state, or global, we need to be able to build this infrastructure in a way that we haven't deployed infrastructure uh, certainly over the past two decades and, and really further back than that. And I think there's a, a reckoning that is coming where the environmental laws that we've set forward have been used not only to thwart infrastructure that might be quote unquote dirty, but also now is thwarting clean energy projects as well. And we've seen cases of that, uh, not only in Berkeley, California, but uh, all around the country as well. So it really is totally the wrong paradigm that we're operating under today. Um, and it needs to be a different type of conversation, right? How do you actually build new infrastructure? And ClearPath worked with the Aspen Institute uh, this time last year to release a report, the Building Cleaner Faster Report, and I encourage you all to check it out. But changing that paradigm from uh, a long, arduous permitting process to immediate or accelerated approvals for clean energy projects, making sure the adjudication timeline does not bog projects down and really reducing that risk profile for that uh, capital investment uh, are two major changes that I think really will be needed, not only to look at the, the short term and acute energy crisis that we're in, uh, but also meeting our goals between now and mid-century as well. Yeah, great point. And, and you mentioned the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Uh, I, I feel like it's having its moment in the spotlight and not necessarily for good reasons. Uh, you know, and, and you're right, you've seen kind of Folks from the right comment on, on the problems with NEPA, folks from the left, uh, you, you mentioned uh, chats, but also um, Ezra Klein has talked about the frustrations with NEPA. Uh, you saw the Bloomberg editorial board uh, write a pretty scathing piece about how it, it, it inhibits the ability to build uh, clean energy infrastructure, new nuclear power plants. Um, but Hannah, also, uh, it affects conservation projects. And I know a lot of the work that, that PERC has done has talked about uh, reducing those regulatory barriers uh, for uh, more active forest management, uh, for more active conservation. So can you talk about the regulatory barriers there and how they're impacting uh, more productive conservation efforts? Certainly. Um, and, and so I think as a little bit of background to this, we have to understand or lay a little groundwork for what's what's going on with with forests in the United States. And so um, if you've turned on the news in any of the most recent years, you will see that wildfires are a huge issue, uh, particularly in the West. We're seeing it's now not uncommon for 10 million acres plus to be burned each year, which is absolutely catastrophic. And so the, the Forest Service and the Biden administration, Nick, as you mentioned uh, at the start of this webinar, have put forward a 10-year plan to try and uh, actively reduce some of the fuels loading. So certainly there are a number of factors that contribute to wildfire. Uh, it can be climate, ignition sites, all, all of these things. But one of the biggest ones that we can control most effectively is the fuels loading. And so that means 
uh, overgrowth, dead and dying trees in our forests, those sorts of things. Uh, fuels that would take maybe a, a spark or an ignition source and turn it into the catastrophic wildfires that fill the headlines today. So what, what the Biden administration has set forward to do um, in the Forest Service is to treat up to 50 million acres in the next 10, 10 years. And that would be a combination of like 20 million Forest Service lands, and then also 30 million um, other federal agencies, private lands, states, um, the, the issue of forests more broadly. Um, so in order to do that, certainly some financial resources will be needed. And we've seen huge uh, financial investments through the infrastructure package, the omnibus re budget request for this upcoming year, but all of that money, if we're being thrown at a problem, it can actually make a difference on the ground if it all gets caught up in these administrative processes and, and not actually being translated to doing the work. And so this is where NEPA comes in, the National Environmental Policy Act that, that Matt was just discussing, um, which requires these environmental reviews to happen before work can take place. And uh, we actually have, PERC has a, a forthcoming report where we were able to actually really dive into this research and the data and, and find that for forest restoration projects, including uh, mechanical thinning and prescribed burns and, and, and those sorts of tools, those projects actually take way longer to get through this NEPA environmental review process than any other projects within the Forest Service. And so we're finding if you have to go through the most stringent environmental review and do an uh, environmental impact statement for mechanical treatments, so that could um, involve commercial timber harvesting or just hand crews going in with chainsaws and removing some of that fuel, um, you're looking at over five years to be able to move from idea to implementation when you have to go through an uh, EIS. For prescribed burns, you're looking at over seven years. And so if we're setting these 10-year goals of the work that we want done on the ground, which I think is so important and is actually having really great bipartisan support, if we're looking at 10 years of approval or seven years of approval to do a prescribed burn, that is a huge problem to keep us from getting that. Uh, that work actually done. And so I do think we need to look for some some changes here. And uh, I think NEPA was very well intended, right? But oftentimes the goal with this is just to say, how do we stop bad actions instead of saying, how do we facilitate good actions and accelerate those good actions? So at PERC, we've been looking at things like how do we apply existing tools better, including uh, categorical exclusions. We have some really great tools. How can we maybe use those better or expand those? How can we provide litigation relief so that the NEPA process doesn't just get tangled in litigation? So again, we can accelerate that process. How can we better use private partners and, and some of those tools where I think there are some good solutions here that can uphold those environmental goals uh, while still acknowledging that timelines matter um, and we need to be doing more quickly. Yeah, great points all around. Um... Uh, I think your point about maintaining those environmental safeguards is critical too, because I think anytime someone mentions NEPA reform, you know, it sounds like you want to gut NEPA or do away with all types of environmental safeguards or public participation or even the ability to have a lawsuit. And I, I mean, speaking for myself, I know that's not what I want. I want to have the process work more efficiently. So we have that uh, stakeholder engagement. So we make sure these projects are, are safely built or, or safely carried out. Um, but done so in, in a, a more efficient manner. Um, Hannah, you mentioned prescribed burns. I want to stick with that for a second because they've also been in the news uh, for a little bit uh, in recent days because two of those prescribed burns uh, escaped in New Mexico last month and the Forest Service recently announced the 90-day pause on controlled burns on national forest system lands. And I know this is kind of relative, a relatively recent announcement from the Forest Service, but I I, don't, I was wondering if you could kind of comment on this. One, do you know what happened and, and kind of why these prescribed burns kind of got away from the folks who were doing them? Uh, and just any general commentary you could make on what this decision uh, might mean, good or bad? Certainly, and the situation in New Mexico that you referenced is, is tragic and a situation that we want to avoid. Um, so what's happened down there is there were some prescribed burns scheduled, they'd gone through the approval process, um, but ultimately the day of, they, they got out of control. And, and again, as you mentioned, it's, it's relatively new, reviews are being done, and I, I'm not a burn boss, I can't speak to the unique conditions on the ground those days. Um, however, what, what has been reported is that uh, 
heavy winds picked up, which caused the fire to get out of control. And so normally when you're doing a burn of this sort, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's very well managed, right? You have these plans, you wait for the weather windows. It's not just let's go out and start things on fire. It's a very orchestrated um, activity. And I believe the Forest Service, even when they put out their announcement to halt all prescribed burns on forest system lands, they recognize that 99.8% of burns go off perfectly, right? So it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit that we have this situation where, it's like an airplane crash, right? Like no one reports on all of the airplanes that land effectively or land when everything goes smoothly, but we have a few really bad instances and that raises fear. Again, should we make sure that we are controlling for the environmental factors and, and being wary of conditions on the day of? Absolutely, I 100% think that we need to be careful with these sorts of things, um, but implementing a, a, a larger nationwide ban goes back to the kind of previous comment I had of how do we, of us being really risk adver adverse um, and maybe trying to stop all bad actions at the expense of potential good actions. Um, the conditions in Montana, for example, are very different than the conditions on the ground in New Mexico. Um, and, and do we need to be wary of changing conditions? Absolutely, but I also know of stories right around where I am in Bozeman where we are finally doing forest restoration work to protect our watershed. If the forest around Bozeman went up in flames, it's estimated that we'd have about a three day supply of water for our entire community if the forest burned. So we're doing some of this work to reduce the fuels loading. Prescribed burns were scheduled to happen, uh, weather permitting, conditions permitting over the next few months uh, because it has been fairly wet here. But now with this nationwide ban, like our local situation can't happen, even if all of the stars aligned here. So I do think we need to be, of course, responsible in how we conduct these measures, but appreciate that we, we have to understand local conditions and that nationwide bans probably aren't the best way to go about this. Yeah, I think the, a, a bit of a over course correction, um, and that happens a lot in policy where you kind of have these knee jerk poly, policy responses, um, whether it's with drilling bans or, or you know, permitting extensions um, or, or, or straight up um, cancellations of projects as a result of um, something that may have been an isolated event. Uh, so um, point, point well taken. Uh, you also spoke about kind of the importance of um, empowering local communities and, and states to lead. And I think that's something, Matt, I wanted to turn to you because you've worked at the state uh, level uh, on trying to implement uh, a, a number of clean energy projects uh, in New Hampshire. So um, I'd like to, I know this is largely a discussion about federal policy, but uh, having that, that state and local input, I think, is critically important, too, because it's, NEPA is a, a big policy obstacle to building and to conservation projects, but there's also a number of state and local uh, challenges that come, and, and usually you want the people with the, the best knowledge to carry out these projects, and those are closest situated to the project to car carry out these projects, but it can also result in a lot of you know, NIMBYism and, and problems with uh, zoning regulations and a, a number of things there. So um, comment on your time in New Hampshire and, and what you saw worked well versus what, what could be changed. Absolutely, and, and I appreciate, you know, the chance to talk from a state perspective. Prior to joining ClearPath, I was the state budget director for Governor Snunu up in New Hampshire, uh, and prior to that, his uh, energy advisor. And so many of these federal regulations ultimately do get implemented at the state level. Right. So there's an importance to have uh, state and federal conformity between what the standards are nationally versus what the standards are locally. And we've seen this ultimately rear its ugly head when it comes to building transmission. Uh, as one example, whether it be the Northern Pass project uh, in New Hampshire or the transmission line in Maine that ultimately went to a ballot referendum last November uh, and the voters uh, ha had decided to prohibit any sort of future high voltage DC uh, transmission development. So it has to work together, right? And there are certainly local issues that no federal policy response uh, to uh, change how NEPA is administered uh, would ultimately impact these decisions. So it's important uh, that ultimately these decisions are made locally at the state level. Uh, and what I would say is one example where this is working well uh, comes to class six wells, uh, where the states that have applied for primacy essentially taking the process over from the feds and administering it through state agencies 
uh, has led to quicker timelines, uh, more projects getting built. Uh, states like Texas, Louisiana, recently North Dakota, um, where, where the state can administer this process. If it's a state priority, it's not sitting in a stack of paper uh, at federal headquarters, uh, but the process is actually moving along. Um, so I, I completely agree that when it does come to state level policymaking, um, a lot of the challenges are, are beyond what's in the scope of federal laws, whether it be the workforce challenges of hiring the right people at the state level, you know, the biologists, the engineers to review these applications. Um, there, there certainly isn't a federal policy silver bullet. Yeah, agreed. And, and again, uh, back to Alex's original comment about tax policy affecting everything, you know, I think one thing people are taking a, a hard look at it is, is certainly tax policy, and we had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017. Uh, and one of the things that I was struck by was the immediate expensing provision and how that impacted investment and innovation and uh, acceleration of research and development projects. So, Alex, I know you've written about this. I think it was last January you wrote a paper, um, as well as other commentaries on immediate expensing and the economic and environmental benefits of it. I was wondering if you could, one, first kind of explain to the layperson what immediate expensing is, um, what you see as the potential benefits and, and why it could be critical for uh, both energy and environmental investments. Sure, yeah. So I think I'd start out with, you know, this is an issue that matters for growth as a whole. Uh, a whole uh, a lot, but that also has certain very important spillovers when we think about, um, uh, you know, an energy transition, you know, towards uh, more clean, uh, sort of towards cleaner energy. Um, and so, I guess to start out, what is a corporate income tax? Well, it's a tax on profits, uh, which is which are revenues minus costs. Um, but how exactly you classify revenues and and more importantly costs often sort of varies. Um, usually, uh, your everyday expenses, um, you can deduct immediately your salaries, uh, you know, office supplies, you know, your post-it notes, the electric bill, uh, these are deducted immediately, but these sort of big capital projects, thinking a new building, a new machinery, um, yeah, those things, uh, have to be spread out over several years, um, and why does that matter? Um, when deductions are spread out over time, uh, they lose value. Uh, if you spend uh, $100,000 on a new machine and uh, you have to spread that deduction out for five years and deduct $20,000 each of those years, those future deductions are going to be worth less than they would be if you just deducted the whole $100,000 immediately. Um, this is primarily, or depending on inflation rates and interest rates. This is uh, especially if with current inflation, that's mostly because of inflation. Um, that, uh, you know, if you can imagine if we have inflation keeping up where it is right now, um, $20,000 uh, five years from now is going to be worth a lot less than $20,000 today. Um, and so effectively, this creates a tax bias against investment because essentially you can deduct your everyday costs but not your big capital costs. Um, and this it matters for a lot of things in the economy. It matters for growth and productivity by creating a disincentive for investment. Um, you know, people invest less and investment drives productivity growth for workers, uh, which is what drives economic growth and it's what drives wage growth. Um, and then on a sort of more micro scale, um, it creates a tax bias against firms and more importantly, industries more heavily reliant on capital, uh, on physical capital. Um, uh, think, think your manufacturers and energy. Um, and what does this have to do with the environment? Well, one of the things is energy efficiency. Uh, if you think about, um, you know, investments in energy efficiency involve a trade-off. You're probably spending more on the appliance or piece of equipment or whatnot um, that's more efficient, that's newer and, and better um, in exchange for lower future costs of your energy bill. Um, but in a system where you have uh, your, you get to deduct the sort of 
the annual costs of, of en your energy bill, but you don't get to fully deduct the real value of your capital investment, um, you are on the margin going to prefer the less energy efficient appliance. Um, but I think that matters on even a broader scale um, when you're talking about whether you invest to replace an existing piece of machinery you already have. Um, and that's sort of true, you know, because older machinery generally tends to be uh, less efficient, whether that's, um, you know, parts of a found, you know, a steel plant, a foundry or an older building. Um, and then there's sort of a third issue here that is, is kind of takes some time, but uh, it's about density and housing construction. Um, back in the Tax Reform Act of 1986, um, it lengthened the um, asset life, which is the amount of time you have to spread a deduction over for residential uh, commercial uh, housing uh, from uh, 19 years to 27 and a half. Um, basically, companies have to spread deductions for that kind of investment out for much longer. Um, and that creates a, a much larger tax penalty. And on the whole, that made the tax treatment of multifamily housing, which tend to be this more corporate um, finance, uh, you know, the business uh, run um, housing is, is generally multifamily. Uh, it created a big tax advantage against that in favor of owner occupied single family homes. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why that matters for the environment. Um, the first is, it's a tax bias against structures and for similar reasons that you want you know, newer structures relative to older structures, uh, older machinery to new machinery, new structures, older structures. But additionally, um, multifamily units are more efficient uh, uh, energy-wise um, because they have fewer you know, out exterior facing walls that you know, um, uh, lose, which are where you, know, you lose heat or, or cool. Um, and then the other factor is that multifamily housing tends to be denser. And uh, when you have a sort of sprawl, which is what we have in a lot of places, um, that means longer commutes and more transit emissions. So more dense housing means uh, you know, shorter commutes, um, lower emissions. Um, and so the tax, ta uh, tax Cuts and Jobs Act established full expensing for or 100% bonus depreciation. It's, kind of basically the same thing, it's kind of different, let's not get into weeds there, um, uh, for equipment and, and ma machinery, um, but uh, it did not have uh, expensing for structures. Um, and it also uh, actually started to make companies starting this year spread deductions for R&D out over five years, which they hadn't had to do um, until now. Um, and ad additionally, the um, expensing for machinery it starts to phase out at the end of this year. So um, keeping that permanent and expanding expensing to, to structures and R&D um, would be greatly helpful in sort of encouraging investment broadly and also specifically investment in these sort of things that, that help reduce carbon emissions and, and accelerate the transition. Yeah, thanks for that explanation and uh, detailed uh providing the economic and environmental benefits of what expensing would do. Uh, you know, I've also seen research that has shown, uh, you know, as a result of the lack of housing supply, that's also pushed people into more rural areas, uh, which has uh, increased kind of this wild land urban interface, um, which increases the potential uh, risks of uh, more activity out there and then potentially more wildfires too, which isn't uh, the you know, the full cause of, of what's increasing the risks of wildfires, but a contributing factor. Uh, Alex, just sticking with you uh, real quick, um, and then I, you mentioned something about research and development, which I, I want to get into because I think it affects all of the issue areas that you guys work on. Uh, you know, let's say we made immediate expensing available for uh, longer asset class lives and we did it for for buildings. And, you know, we enact that starting in the year 2024, and you're an investor and just bought a building in, you know, 2022 or 2023. Is I imagine if you're the builder, or the investor who just did that in 2022 or 2023, you're going to think that's very unfair. Um, how do you? Is there a way to correct for that, or is this something that we should just think that that's almost like a sunk cost and we just need to move forward with good policy? Um, I, I've seen it come up as a, a concern with 
immediate expensing for longer asset class lives. So I wanted to hear how you would address that. Yeah, so I would say, you know, I think the the advantage of of full expensing for investment relative to say lowering the corporate income tax rate is that it is only benef you know, unless unless you add something on that provides a a windfall benefit to people who have already invested. Um, you know, on its own, it is only a tax cut on new investment. Um, when you lower the corporate tax rate, you know, that uh, increases the sort of potential rate of return on new investment, which on the margin incentivizes new investment. Um, but at the same time, you're also giving a tax cut to people who are just making returns on investments they already made. Um, which is doesn't do much to sort of stimulate additional economic activity or investment. That's just a sort of windfall gain. Um, the advantage of expensing in its sort of purest form is to um, it gets more bang for your buck basically for the amount of tax for the for the tax cut that you're doing because all of the the money goes towards incentivizing new investment. Um, so in some ways, I think that's actually uh, an advantage of expensing relative to lowering a cor corporate tax rate. Um, I know that there are some ideas like a neutral cost recovery, which is basically instead of just having expensing saying, well, you're, you're going to spread the deductions out, but you are going to adjust them for inflation and a real rate of return. So it's economically equivalent to expensing, but, um, that's sort of a, another way to, to get the sort of similar economic results. Um, but with some of the thornier issues sort of put off, um, but uh, but I think in some way in but in some ways the the only applying to new investment is an advantage of of expensing rather than a a um, disadvantage. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, and you mentioned R and D, and again, I think that's something that that is very much cross cutting. And uh, regardless of kind of what happens with um, some of the other big bills that are out there, um, you know, the reality is we're going to be spending a, a lot of money. Uh, on these issues. And Matt, you mentioned that's kind of the easy part is spending this money. Um, and, you know, we have the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or the Energy Act of 2020, you know, there's going to be hydrogen hubs and direct air capture, there's going to be money for forest management and invasive species and for basic R&D and for climate resiliency. So um, I'm going to open up this question to anyone who wants to take it and feel free to, to pile on. But absent kind of the NEPA reforms, what are some other things we should be thinking about and policymakers should be thinking about to uh, spend this money more effectively, to stretch taxpayer dollars further, to um, have good governance and transparency as to how this money is spent and, and ultimately get to some of the results we want to see if we are going to be spending this money? I'm happy to start on that, Nick, and this is certainly something that ClearPath is focused on, right? Actually deploying these dollars that, that Congress has appropriated. Um, the administration, the Department of Energy, just this week held their 180-day webinar, so we're officially six months in to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and granted, a lot of that time has been spent behind the scenes, developing funding opportunities, uh, allowing for public comment. Uh, but through the remainder of this year and into next year, we're certainly going to start to see uh, these funding opportunities produce awards, and those awards will produce projects. Uh, and assuming they can actually get permitted in a, in a timely fashion, uh, we're going to start seeing the fruits of all this work that policymakers have done over the past two years. That means that some projects are going to fail. Now, that's part of what investment in innovation and research and development will lead to. If the government is batting 100%, that probably means the private market could have assumed that risk and built those projects out. But to actually really get through the breakthroughs and the most impactful technologies, that means there are going to be some failures along the way. Now, it's important that when it comes to oversight, uh, that Congress holds the administration accountable. No one wants to see another cylinder or any other one of those scandals that we saw uh, coming out of the Great Recession. But there will be some projects that don't quite pan out for one reason or another. Uh, and part of what that looks like is making sure uh, that these taxpayer dollars are used appropriately, that the programs are carried out consistent with congressional intent uh, and not uh, distorted by one way or another. Uh, and I think ultimately that comes to not only advocacy groups, but also industry uh, 
working with the Department of Energy through these uh, public comment periods to make sure that these programs are set up for success. Um, and, and I think time will tell how effective the department will be in crafting these funding opportunities, uh, but certainly a great opportunity um, to promote uh, research development uh, and especially the hydrogen hubs uh, that you referenced, Nick, $8 billion of investment potential uh, to really accelerate some of these just over the horizon technologies um, and the potential impacts not only domestically, but also from a geopolitical energy security perspective uh, really could be profound. I'll, I'll maybe jump in be... on some on some forest stuff here, because um, I think Matt's points on uh, just like the importance of R&D and ensuring that dollars are implemented well. Uh, we, we share that priority and ensuring that uh, as these resources are are appropriated and given out, how do we ensure that they translate to good results on the ground? Um, and so one, one of the things that we've run into is there are some like appropriations and spending complications that prevent some long-term contracting with the Forest Service or where they're only able to commit to spending within a certain appropriation cycle or, or things like that. And, and at a time where there are a lot of private entities um, interested in getting involved in forest management, and I say that in addition to the timber industry, I don't think the timber industry alone can solve all of these problems, certainly, uh, but need to be a player in the space. But other innovative groups like uh, Blue Forest, which is a conservation group kind of based in California, but is looking to expand, they're doing these really interesting forest resilience bonds um, and there's an opportunity for groups like that to have a huge role in bringing private resources, be it capital or personnel, to the ground to get some of this done in partnership uh, with, with federal agencies. The challenge then sort of remains in how, do, how can we structure those, those contracts uh, with the resources that were given and the, and the limitations on those resources. So that's an area that we're trying to look at. Um, maybe jumping back to prescribed burns a little bit, like that that ultimately takes resources, that takes certifications, that takes knowledge about all the different factors that go into making a prescribed burn a success. Um, but another regulatory barrier that we're seeing to, to prevent the sort of investment uh, in doing more of these prescribed burns from actually taking place uh, is that prescribed burns count against a state's Clean Air Act compliance, the, the emissions from that burn. And certainly there are, um, pollutant concerns that come from smoke like that. We, we have to take that as given. However, uh, catastrophic wildfires and the emissions from those do not count against Clean Air Act instances. And here, so I'm not saying that we should like count everything against the Clean Air Act, but again, we just need to think about how do we balance the risks of doing nothing and, and then the subsequent consequences that could come from doing nothing. And so I think we need to think through how can we structure some of these these policies, again, in a way to say, obvious ground uh, like frameworks and responsibilities need to be built into how we conduct these things, uh, but also how do we ensure that we're recognizing the, the potential benefits in addition to very small risks. And part of that comes back to, uh, and there's been some talk in the chat, I think, about how do we involve new technologies and new research and new partners in getting this stuff done. And there's great opportunity there. So um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think we have a big enough problem here that people are realizing we have to change how we do things. Um, but, but getting that done is always easier, easier said than done. So we have lots of work to do for sure. Yeah, no kidding. And, and again, viewers, feel free to send questions. I've had a, a couple come my way. And Alex, I want to ask you about the R&D tax credit, but I want to stay with Hannah real quick, because one thing that came as a question to me that I was going to ask you anyway, so um, a good question, uh, is this issue of trade-offs. And one of the trade-offs that we constantly hear about with, with building energy infrastructure or infrastructure broadly uh, and with uh, conservation plans is the Endangered Species Act. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is something where there's uh, conflicting interests from time to time and there's conflicting priorities from time to time. And how do you, uh, I don't know if balance is necessarily the right word, but how do you deal with invasive, or not invasive, excuse me, endangered species that we can talk about invasive species too, but <laughs> How do you deal with the Endangered Species Act uh, laws and requirements, but also making sure that we are, you know, actually recovering endangered species and at the same time uh, making progress forward on some of these other environmental and climate goals? 
Yeah, well, I often think that um, one, of the, one of the only policy issues thornier than NEPA is the Endangered Species Act because it somehow manages to touch just about everything and people always have very strong opinions on it one way or the other. So maybe again, prefacing this by saying, I think the, like, the intentions of the Endangered Species Act are good, right? The goal is how do we how do we help conserve species and wildlife that contribute all of these things to the environment and humans and, and all of that. The challenge then, is, as you were saying, Nick, is the impacts that uh, concerns for these species can have over, over everything. Um, and so one example that I think lays this out really, really nicely is um, there was an instance in California where a forest uh, was proposed, there were, there were projects proposed to help reduce wildfire risk in, in this forest. Um, and it had pretty broad support, it was hoping to move forward. However, a group brought forward litigation saying that the, the projects would harm endangered owls in the area who, who had their habitat in these forests that were going to be treated. Well, as all of this was tied up in litigation, the forest burned, right? And so suddenly we had all of that habitat get completely wiped out instead of um, work being conducted in a way that could actually restore and in the long term be beneficial for these species. So oftentimes I think, again, we need to ask ourselves, what are the consequences of doing nothing versus actually trying to think, what do we want this landscape to look like? How do we actually foster habitat or situations where we can promote recovery of species rather than just kind of keeping in this in, them in this Endangered Species Act emergency room? Um, there's a lot of controversy over potential weaponization of the Endangered Species Act, right? Are people actually concerned about this species or do they just want to use it to throw a wrench in a project that's being done? Um, the Cottonwood decision, which is uh, uh, out of out of the Ninth Circuit, it impacts Montana very intensively. It uh, it kind of dictates where if there's new knowledge on endangered species um, that could be impacted by a forest plan, like we got to go back to square one and restart planning. So we've seen instances of that being used to really throw off projects. Um, I think we really need a fix for that sort of thing. But it just goes to show the intersection of endangered species habitat. And I know uh, to, to the energy side of things, like endangered species concerns have also been huge in energy development projects, but on the forest side, especially, and it all needs to come back to what do we want, what, what good outcomes do we want, and how do we ensure we're actively moving towards that rather than just saying stop, don't touch anything. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I really like the phrase Endangered Species Act Emergency Room. I'd never heard of that before. I don't know if that's yours, but I'm probably going to steal it. Uh, Perfect. Well, I probably <laughs> borrowed it from one of my PERC colleagues who maybe got it from someone else. That's so good. we'll it's just circulate it. Around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Alex, getting back to you and the R&D tax credit. I know the Tax Foundation has written on the R&D tax credit and its impact on research and development. Um, can you comment on that and, and potential ways to improve the credit? Yeah, so I think a good way to start, I think I'm going to build off something Matthew said about federal grants um, for research that, yes, some of them are, are going to fail, but that's something we sort of accept. Um, uh, you know, that, that is part of the process is that some research is fruit, it ends up being sort of fruitless, but it's worth the risk to fund because sometimes you get these sort of really big payoffs and you get, you know, that, that lead to sort of huge technological change. And there's a well, long uh, academic literature to say that these sort of social benefits of, of private R&D are much higher than the, just the benefits to the company uh, that um, performs the, the R&D, which justifies uh, some kind of subsidy. Um, now, unlike sort of expensing where it's like, yeah, you just deduct all your costs, simple. Um, you know, the R&D tax credit has many sort of complicated components um, about, you know, well, it's an incremental credit, which means that, you know, it's only on research that's above a certain baseline level that you have as a company. And um, it's sort of a complicated uh, a, a credit that, um, you know, the sort of details about making sure everything seems, seems to be exactly right. Um, can make it inaccessible to smaller firms or newer firms who have less of a uh, sort of ability to navigate it. So um, I think that there's a, an argument for sort of a simpler uh, a credit um, 
even if that's at the expense of some sort of technical structural component um, that we think is, 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 you know, on paper more efficient, but when you have the sort of compliance burden associated with it, you'd, it makes more sense to make it more broadly accessible. So um, not just sort of bigger companies uh, benefit from it as sort of more accessible broadly. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's the story with the R&D credit, that sort of a simpler and cleaner credit is, is better than, than what we have now. Great, and, and speaking of credits, one of the questions that came in was um, a comment and a question. It said, uh, uh, I don't think we should be subsidizing mature technologies with tax credits, but the widened tax bill to simplify all energy tax credits seems like a good next best solution. Um, I guess this is probably more of a question for Alex and Matt, but have you guys looked at this bill and do you have thoughts on it? Sure, happy to start and Alex, feel free to pile on from there. Uh, I mean, the Wyden bill uh, is pretty clearly targeted at the Build Back Better Reconciliation Package, which I mean, we'll, we'll save that for another webinar. Uh, but clear path, we do support technology neutral tax policy. And one example of that uh, that Senator Risch has been championing is the Energy Sector Innovation Credit, which would provide uh, a tax credit for first, second, and third of a kind type projects, right? So trying to solve that valley of death where we know a technology uh, has worked at the lab or the bench scale, but it still hasn't proven itself uh, to attract private capital, right? So if you can reduce the overall uh, cost of these innovations, right, to survive that period uh, between the national labs or the demonstration project through DOE and actually getting into commercialization, uh, doing so uh, based on the level of market penetration is much better than picking winners and losers right, or providing specific tax credits for specific technologies that don't have to compete against anyone else in the market. Uh, so with the energy sector innovation tax credit, uh, again, it doesn't matter on what technology you're using, it really focuses on how advanced you are, what level of penetration you are in the market, because uh, I would completely agree we shouldn't be subsidizing mature technology. Um, that's not really the role the government should fill, but really promote it on the innovation side of things and making sure we can get more and more technologies to market uh, and get them into a commercial state. Uh, yeah, I'll jump, I'll jump in here as well. Um, I just to answer Drew's question in the, in the chat, uh, I believe the, that um, the, the Maggie Hass, Senators uh, Maggie Hassan and uh, Young from, you know, Hassan from, from New Hampshire and Young from Indiana have a bill on the R&D credit to make it sort of more broadly accessible for startups. Um, and then as far as the widen credit uh, reform sort of package goes, I think it's sort of a directional improvement. Um, at the same time, I know that there are some provisions that it would get rid of um, related to fossil fuels that are sort of normal. Um, tax provisions that aren't really tax breaks, uh, like expensing for intangible drilling costs. Um, you know, expensing for, for any cost is um, sort of neutral. It's, it's not a, a targeted subsidy. Um, so there are sort of pluses and minuses there, um, but I think it would probably, at least on the, the um, uh, carrot side of environmental, uh, of sort of uh, environmental green energy policy, I think would probably be an improvement. Um, there is, you know, certainly a strong uh, a case to be made for the the stick approach, which is a, a carbon price. Um, but uh, as far as the at least as far as the carrot goes, I think it is better than what we have now. Awesome, thank you. Um, last question goes to Hannah, uh, and then I'll give you guys a chance to. Uh, wrap up with any comments you may have wanted to make that you didn't get a chance to yet. But uh, this question reads, uh, the West must manage a complex web of federal property state and uh, manage a complex web of federal property ownership, state property ownership, and private property ownership with different laws and regulation that guides each. Uh, what's the best way to navigate those complexities and how should policymakers work with private property owners uh, when issues like federal lands may affect their property. And I know you guys have kind of worked on, this is me speaking now, uh, I know Perk's done some work on migration corridors and um, I know that there's, you know, hiking trails that intersect with private property owners. So there's probably a lot to cover here and it's, 
very difficult to answer in a few minutes, but um, I don't know anyone better to answer than that than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It certainly it certainly is complex, um, and each issue kind of has its own unique uh, is, uh, challenges that come along with it. Um, but a few immediate thoughts. I, I really think that the more that we can devolve decision making down to local levels where you have a better sense of who are the unique players on that landscape that will make a big difference one example with forest management um, is the good neighbor authority which is a really valuable tool that we've seen implemented in the west that allows states to actually partner with uh, the forest service or the bureau of land management and then the state itself is able to actually go in and conduct forest restoration efforts uh, on those on those federal lands um, and hopefully the, the lands like within the whole project boundary, which could include state, private, et cetera. Um, ultimately, right, you have to go through permission processes and things like that. Um, but what has been really cool to see is states are jumping at that opportunity. Um, and states, many states in the West Montana included, have been able to actually reach a state where they are, um, the program is generating enough revenue from timber sales as a result of this restoration work to cover the broader restoration pro portfolio, which could include things like prescribed burns and other smaller, smaller steps. So would love to see tools like Good Neighbor Authority continued. Um, beyond that, another interesting example, I think, as you mentioned, Nick, is elk migrations. That's been a huge issue. Um, there's been secretarial orders at the federal level, different things done at the state level. Um, it's really inter interesting interesting because many of these elk herds, like they'll start in Yellowstone National Park, move through Forest Service lands, so you're getting interior, USDA, um, they're a state managed resource, but they're crossing state lines, so you get Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, all involved in these sorts of issues in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And then 80% of elk's winter range is on private lands, so you get private land managers involved there. And so the question of how can we manage and conserve these migration corridors we're dealing with all the jurisdictions possible here. Um, so one of the things that I think is just so important is that we take a landscape level approach while also recognizing we're going to need unique tools for each of those situations. So for example, one of the things PERC has done is we were actually able to partner with the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, another group kind of in the Bozeman area, and work with a, a ranching family to actually compensate them with Montana's first elk occupancy agreement is what we're calling it, uh, where we are actually financially paying this landowner to set aside some of the acreage of their ranch and leave cattle off it for while elk are moving through um, and, and need this migratory habitat. So those are the sorts of solutions where we were able to get that done in a matter of a few months, including funding, contracting, et cetera. Um, certainly there are federal and state programs that can do similar things, but I think that that timeline just is not possible uh, when you add in bureaucracy. So I think it just goes to show ultimately it was the this project was the result of so many conversations with all of those different levels and jurisdictions, um, but we were able to really tailor a solution to what worked with that individual landowner. So it's difficult, but I think we can really do it if we are sensitive to the fact that each jurisdiction, each landowner has unique needs and circumstances, and we need to be willing to take those local approaches instead of a one size fits all top down a regulatory approach. And it really needs to be those voluntary incentive based approaches rather than big government regulation. Yeah, that's a really great answer and a really great example. Um, well, we're running up uh, on the hour here. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for uh, watching this webinar. I want to thank our three panelists for participating. Um, providing these insights, uh, really uh, invaluable insights and, and a lot of invaluable products that come out of these organizations, so I'd check them out. Uh, I just want to give you guys a chance to um, pitch anything you guys are, or plug anything you guys are working on, any events you guys might have coming up, any, uh, Hannah, I know you mentioned some new research coming out. Uh, if you guys want to take a minute or two to talk about anything y'all are working on, um, feel free to do so. I, I could, Matt, start with you, then go to Hannah and finish up with Alex. Sure, absolutely, and and would encourage everyone to check out the Energy Sector Innovation Credit. Uh, and again, Senator Crapo uh, from Idaho is the lead sponsor on the Senate for that. And also, when it does come to the Infrastructure Act Clear Path, we are working on tracking these dollars uh, very aggressively. Uh, we should have a product launching at some point later this year, uh, and very excited to to watch this money flow to good projects uh, that Congress has authorized. Um, so be on the lookout for that on the Clear Path site. 
Awesome. Uh, Nick, you mentioned on, on the perk side of things, we have a big report on the Forest Service and NEPA implications coming out. It's kind of the first of its kind look at uh, specific forest management projects and, and the NEPA delays for a lot of those. So that's that's really exciting. You'll be able to find that or any whole sort of natural resource policy related issues on our website, which is just perkperc.org. And uh, our big project coming up uh, related to taxes and uh, environmental policy is a, a piece on, on carbon taxes. Um, I think a lot of the debate ends up being sort of very broad, abstract, carbon taxes are good or carbon taxes are bad for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, we're trying to take a more sort of nuanced look at, um, you know, there are good and bad ways to do them. And there are, you know, in inefficient and inefficient ways to use the revenue. So um, keep an eye on that. Great. Well, thank you guys again so much. Um, I really appreciate the discussion and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.